right? What I was, uh, what I put together here was a, uh, just a general conversation on what it is like to do Drupal stuff day to day, whether it's your full-time work uh, for a company or as a freelancer such as myself. And um, w my goal here was to give the talk that I wish I had seen years ago. Drupal is a big open source free platform uh, and we tend to kind of lean toward all the free tools. We tend to lean toward all the free trials of everything, <laughs> kind of maximize them, maybe put multiple aliases on in order to, uh, well, some of us do, one of us does. Uh, and, and there's a lot of good benefit out there for free. What I was hoping to do is provide a little bit of navigation on what's out there, uh, what we can do with our time, and uh, how to maximize it. Drupal is nonetheless a, uh, well, I'll skip over all that business as well because I'm here. This is me, um, my family. They're the reasons I do what I do. And I've left them all in College Station to be here today. Let's talk about some of the challenges that come with uh, working in this kind of a content management system and specifically working in with small teams. Uh, we have We'll be talking about some of the team collaboration challenges, remote workspaces. That's where you have, uh, you know, you got your live server and all that uh, staging. You got to keep everything in sync and with remote team members. I do most of my work remotely as well. I, I, I seldom come into an office. And remote can be, you know, across town even. As I discovered, it takes a long time to get across town here. Um, who here is completely independent? Right? But you probably do some contract work with other uh, maybe agencies, maybe you've got some uh, business that way. All right, so a couple folks here. Um, when, we have a, when we have teamwork, some of the, uh, some of the things we need to worry, worry about are still gaining myself here. Um, right. Periodically we have these Maybe you have a daily stand-up, if that's what your, what your group does. Uh, maybe you have a weekly check-in. Maybe you have to talk directly to the client. Maybe you make some in-person visits. We have, um, there are some ways to <coughs> facilitate that. I'm sure you've got all these Skype, Google Hangouts, all that business. But those present some challenges in and of themselves. You've got connectivity issues and all that business. Uh, nonetheless, it's very important to do these because uh, as many of you probably have come to know, uh, there are some different things. You might overlap on the same project. You might overlap on the same specific module code. And you might want to tell your, your people, hey, I did this. Uh, you know, you got to come, come up with ways to synchronize that. So we're going to talk about some of the tools to go about doing that. When you've got a large project to work on, obviously you need to divvy up the load. Um, and maybe stick to the plan. When, once you've divvied it up, if you say you're going to work on XYZ, you've got to definitely work on that and, uh, and hand off and trust your other team members to work on that. Trust they're not going to come late to anything. When you have, uh, that was number three already. Didn't do it. No, we'll start last. Thank you. We, um, we talk about putting in a, a, a standard workflow. We talk about DevOps. DevOps are, of course, uh, how you actually work on the code, how you work on the project, how you deploy, uh, different mechanisms you can work with. In Drupal in particular, um, we've got this idea that some stuff is captured in code and some things are captured in the database. And then there's always content as well. You know, how much of the content is part of the structure of the site as well. Please forgive me if I try to burn through the first couple pages here. <laughs> and if anybody wants me to slow down, please uh, don't. Just kidding, kind of. Uh, we also have within the workflow the various mechanisms by which we share the, uh, the, the work that we're working on. Some examples might include uh, maybe a long time ago or maybe still. A, a lot of directions you find to say when you want to install a module, you go here, you FTP it to your site, you unzip it, do all that stuff. You see a lot of that still. But uh, I've not run into in many working environments where people are still doing so much by hand. We do a lot of things in version control, and we use ver version control as our transport. Well, when you do that, uh, you've got to sync up with your team members as well. 
make sure that everyone's looking at the latest when they're busy doing what they're doing. Uh, and if you have a particular way that you like to work, or if you're working with an agency that has their specific nuances, you really got to uh, typically have to sync up on the same, same workflow. It, it's very frustrating when you're working in Git, for instance, and you've got all your stuff flying through and you're doing really well, and then somebody else gets on the server and kind of modifies this right here, and you know your your stuff is now out of sync, but it's not even resyncable really. You have to do some juggling, and unfortunately, sometimes with either project management or code management, there's a bit of overhead in uh, managing that when it kind of flops on you. There's some uh, lots of different ways to automate your work. You can do uh, uh, you can work with Drupal profiles which you've seen uh, you know, contributed profiles, which are kind of recipes that you enable the site. You say, do you want to do minimal? Do you want to do standard? Or do you want to do this particular profile? Maybe it's a social networking site, something. It's just a pre-built Drupal kind of a thing. Well, uh, with Astonish Design, we, for a time, I'm kind of rogue. Maybe I wasn't always adhering. But we tried to stick within the profile uh, methodology, where everything you do goes in the profile and that's pretty much all you capture in Git, or all you capture in the code repo. The core files, module files, all that business comes in because of the profile, because of the, uh, I said that wrong, because of the make file. Uh, another thing I'd like to mention here is Drupal build tools. I don't know what the status of that is. I think you've changed it completely. Are you still using? Yeah. Okay. There, there was at one point uh, the idea that you have this uh, real scripted, nice build mechanism that helps you to work with these profiles so that when either somebody new comes on the team or when you need to work on a particular branch of code or when you need to, uh, when you need to do your laundry, whatever, you, get, you, you can get yourself a Drupal instance that is exactly a snapshot you want to work with. If you have two large feature sets going on and they conflict, you might want to work on this one only. And, uh, and when you check it in, that's done. It's done. And you can come back to this one. And you don't have to worry about the status of this one. Um, that's some Drupal build tools. Apparently, it's changed. It's still active. All right. And that's at drupal.org. It's a sandbox project. Uh, communication is important. Uh, I would like to show you some examples of, if, if, we, if we have time, of kind of differences in communication. You might have a person on the team who his commit messages are you know, done, 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 something like that. Not so great. You, know, you might have one where they're super verbose. I, I like to be extra verbose because there's not really any harm in it when it comes to the commit message itself. When you've got different tools, and when I'm talking about commit, of course, I'm talking about version control. I, I would maybe falsely, I'm making the assumption that we're all in some sort of version control. And every ver version control I've seen allows you to put commit messages in. If you're not putting it in your commit messages, you can put it in a wiki. You can put it in some shared documentation. Uh, we'll go over some tools that are, are good for this. Uh, one thing that I've certainly found is that uh, I, I, I kind of made a 180 from documenting every little bitty thing and basically making these mile-long uh, JIRA issue queues to basically pointing the issue queue to a wiki page and keeping just that one spot updated. Now, to put the two together would be nice. And I mentioned Jira. That's just my, that's my sort of story or ticket tracking tool of choice. Uh, there are bunches, bunches of them out there. But Jira is nice because it goes together with Confluence. We can look at that in a little bit. You can make mentions from one to the other very seamlessly and uh, have basically a, a living documentation page. And it served me very well uh, when project switching or handing off. Uh, <clears throat> regarding organization, it's important to be organized. Now, this is a, I'm referring to uh, having clearly defined roles within your team. Even if you have multiple roles, you still kind of you still know who's the go-to on various things. You've got a you know, client communications people or person, your point contact. Uh, it's very good to have one person who either makes the decisions or represents the decisions made by the client, so that you're not doing a whole bunch of uh, you know, well, so and so said do this and Okay, that's my marching orders this week. But now they, you, know, you don't want that to happen. You do whatever you can to 
set up that upfront contract when starting a new project. Make sure you've got one point contact as best as, as, as closely as possible. And then depending on the client, of course, if you need clarification on a, on a, on a given item that you're working on, uh, depending on the client and what your relationship is with them, if you are the developer, are you allowed to go out and talk to that person? Or do you need to go channel through somebody in your organization to talk to the person? Or do you do like a weekly touch base and queue up your questions? These are all nice ways. If you could structure that with your relationship with the client, it, uh, it gives a good professional front, for one. Uh, and two, it, it, it doesn't distract the client entirely, either. They can know what to expect over time. And again, over at uh, Astonish Designs, we, uh, we've got some great organization in that way, where we've got, uh, we've got the liaison with the client. We've got Nicole, who schedules every little thing. If you need to talk to another team member, it's, it's nice. It's very well organized. I'm happy to be uh, associated with them. Duplication of effort is kind of out of place here. But that is an important thing to go with uh, as far as sharing the workload and, and keeping your team abreast with what it is you're working on. Uh, it, can, it can hurt your team members' emotions. If you're working on the same thing somebody else is working on, maybe it's been sitting in your queue for a while, and they pick it up, and you come back and you say, hey, this is now done. It's, kinda, it's, it's a little condescending. So to keep up morale on the team, it's a good idea to keep constant communication as well. And sometimes it's a real challenge if people are pulled in every which direction. Real briefly, I touch on uh, touch on this remote workspace challenges. Again, this is talking about remote servers. We have. Uh, if you have a client who's got particular stipulations, you need to be on their VPN, for instance. Well, then that might change some of the things you do. I've got a situation where our primary communication protocol is in a little chat room client called HipChat, and it runs on a port that this particular client's VPN doesn't allow uh, communication on. So that kind of, basically, when we go to commit something or go to look at their staging server, because it's all behind their firewall, we kind of, you know, I'm going under. I'm going to cease communication for a little while, or we have to open up a different communication cha uh, channel. It's you know things that come up. You work through them, and uh, we've got some neat solutions on hand that we can talk about to uh, to overcome those. Uh, we talked about the separation of code on file versus database captured configuration and content. Uh, there are a lot of great resources out there about. Uh, I guess a couple of years ago, they used to call it the holy grail of Drupal development was how to share all that, but it's come a long way, and there are a lot of great resources out there. Uh, a couple, one fairly new one to me I'd like to share. There's a module called stage file proxy. It's got underscores between those three words. And stage file proxy does a really neat thing. It, uh, when you pull in a new project, you typically grab the code base, or if you're doing build, build tools or profiles or something, you grab whatever it is you need to build your site, and you've got basically a, a local Drupal database, a uh, Drupal site with your local database. Uh, with stage file proxy, however, you don't need to go grab that, you know, maybe several gigs site's default files folder where all of your Drupal files are stored. Stage file proxy works like this. It says, uh, when enabled locally, it says when Drupal is requesting to pull a file, it looks locally first. If it's in site default files, if it doesn't find that file there, then it's going to go out to whatever remote server you've specified. Then it'll go grab the file, plop it down, and it captures it that way. So if you've got you know, a library full of uh, 1,000 PDFs or some movie files or something, some MP, you know, MPEGs, then uh, you don't need to, just to ramp up your development, you don't need to grab all those assets. If, you, if you're working with one node over and over and over and over, and you just refresh that one node, you're only going to pull that one uh, set of files. The stage file proxy comes in real handy like that. Real simple setup. Uh, and you don't need to commit it to your local Git or anything. You just kind of work it into your local environment. And that helps remarkably with uh, remote working. And just real quickly mention that when it comes to remote team members, there are a number of challenges. But it's uh, nothing that's not, that's not true. Everything that we talked about that might be uh, local 
either in the office or in the city or whatever, it, it can potentially compound, of course. You got longer distances. Um, well, you can kind of just imagine that. Uh, if you have any particular questions on that, I'm happy to field some a little bit later. Uh, I've been remote working for, for a number of years. I miss seeing people. Uh, the real impetus behind this presentation to me was what kinds of, what's out there to help us really work well together? And when we run into problems, how do we get over them? That's what we're going to talk about. Let's get into DevOps first. You guys all right with that? <clears throat> I mentioned briefly earlier that DevOps are how we work with the code, how we work with the database, how we work with any changes. Uh, if there's anybody here who is either new to Drupal or is, for whatever reason, not uh, familiar with the features module, what the features module does, it's a, it's a contributor module on Drupal.org that allows you to take all of the database config, everything you've done to click, 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 to make a view, to make content types or entities, uh, set up your fields and all that. You take all that and you capture it and you put it to disk. You don't have to have a floppy disk. You just capture it and the, the beauty of this is then you can, you can store that in your version control. If you need to add some fields or move some fields around, you store those changes. You update the feature and you store those. And uh, what this does for you is you can then share that feature in your code base when you and when you deploy it to your either staging or your remote server, you're not having to go and repeat all your clicky clicky steps. That's the feature module. And that's part of DevOps that uh, anyone I've worked with uh, has been using. There are some challenges with it, and there are a number of resources out there as well to, uh, to overcome those. And we can talk about those as well if someone has particular issues with their features. I, I won't say I've seen them all. But I've seen them all. It's important when working on any kind of project to, to isolate the problem you're working with. And this is also true with, uh, with just coming up with solutions. If you're the solutions architect, someone comes to you with a problem, and a business person comes to you and says, I need you know, XYZ feature. Uh, you need to work your way through the, uh, through the problem. It's very helpful to break it down into what is it exactly that's going on. We've all heard of KISS. Keep it simple, silly. We, uh, <laughs> uh, that, that idea, that concept allows you to break a topic down into stories or uh, tickets, you know, workable, digestible units. And it allows you to release those for review while you're in the middle of a larger feature. And when you talk about Agile, you talk about uh, stories. Stories represent basically features. And if a bunch of stories come together to make something larger happen, but they're all required, they're all interdependent, interdependent, codependent, um, you have this larger thing called an epic. And so uh, you want to break your things down into these large stories and then chop them down into smaller stories so you can work them. Uh, what I've found works best for me is to take a given story or take a given concept and put that in whatever project management tool you're using. I mentioned Jira. Uh, we also use Pivotal Tracker at Astonish. And uh, these are really great tools. Basically, everything you do to refer to the work done on that, if you reference the ticket ID, then it allows you to go back and figure out what's going on. And uh, Pivotal Tracker doesn't yet have this idea that you can type the ticket, the, the story ID, in whatever comments and then automatically links to whatever you're talking about. They said they're, they're, it's on their feature lists. Jira's got it, Jira and Confluence. You go back and forth with that. You put the little bracket, put the little code for your particular project, dash your ticket, your story ID. And in Confluence, it'll show you whatever it is you're working on. Let me, um, dare I tempt this system? Let's see. Yes. You type in the. Uh, I haven't seen it yet. For everything that I say, 
James always has the right answer. <laughs> it's refreshing. It's humbling. Let's take a look here. Um, oh, you didn't see that. Oh, gosh. <laughs> this is not on the video, is it? So wikis are great because you can change them on the fly. Uh, what's a better one? We're going to talk about user spacing, too. That's a really neat thing that James showed me. But I took it and ran with it. Let's, um, let's take a quick look at this particular wiki. This is Confluence. Has anybody here not used some sort of wiki or do Google Docs or something like that? Don't answer that. Either have or you haven't. It doesn't matter. You should use something. Uh, I've used Google Docs extremely effectively, but Confluence to me just does better uh, for some things. Come on. Okay, here's an example of, so I've got this idea that there's an overarching page, and within it, I've got these child pages. As I add a child page, it shows up automatically here, and you can see I've got them sort of conventioned, where I've got Pivotal Tracker and the Story ID. That was all I wanted to show you there, and that is not what I wanted to show you there. Does anybody know how to get back to this? Full screen, thank you. When chopping up things, you can work on the... <laughs> I, I like to work on the larger stories first, when uh, time permitted. You know, if, if it's a... Well, it's not true. I just, I have a hankering for the bigger stories. Maybe I'm... Uh, there's words for that we use, and I don't like to put them on video for that kind of person. But uh, I, I do enjoy that kind of glory to work on the big stories. Uh, when you work on the big stories, it puts the unknowns and it puts the risk behind you. Hopefully it puts it behind you. It at least puts it, <laughs> it puts it where you can work through the risk and you can work through the unknowns. And what I'm referring to is when the client's coming to you and says, hey, can you get this done by you know, uh, you know, two weeks from now? You say, yeah, yes, I'll work on this and all these things. If you work on the big stuff first, then the little things just feel good at the end of the sprint. One way to look at it. Another way to look at it is if you work on the little things first, it might look good in terms of ticket movement, but this big black cloud is still hanging over your head, and you've got to work your way through that. My personal style is to work on the, the, the big, big ticket items first. We're going to come back a little bit here in a little bit. Another little technique that I like to do is, when working directly with the client, uh, alternate between what the client sees and what the client doesn't see. The client hopefully trusts you, and, and hopefully you're demonstrating some progress and things, but you don't want to give them all the heady, behind the scenes, uh, I wrestled with Git, <laughs> I had merged conflicts and all that kind of thing, that's no fun. So you, it's a good idea to balance your workload or your sprint with the uh, things the client can see. And they might be low-hanging fruit, or if you're like me and you can't design your way out of a box, it might be something that you struggle with or can hand to somebody else to do. But the idea is if you can intersperse the work that the client can't see with the work the client can see, they feel a little bit better, in my experience. And um, yeah, that just helps to build that client trust. At the end of the day, if you haven't got client trust, what have you got really? Yes, now I'd like to come back to this DevOps section. Because what I completely overlooked is putting page numbers on my notes. Yes, here we are. We're not going backward, we're going forward, folks. Debugging techniques. What a pain sometimes. Uh, What's most important, I think, in debugging, that's ridiculous, why am I saying most important? One important thing to consider when debugging is where is the issue occurring? Is it a client-side issue or is it out on the server? If it's on the server, is it Apache or is it PHP or is it Drupal itself? Well, let's take a look at some of the client techniques that are uh, very helpful to me. Um, the browser is the browser. 
Is there anybody here who's developing in something other than, are we site builders here? Developers and site builders? All right. Uh, right, so I found Chrome to be the best tool to develop in. I used to be a real big Firefox fan, uh, and then I discovered that Chrome does everything I needed it to do, except for one thing, uh, and doesn't leak memory. I can, I can leave my multiple Chrome browsers open weeks on end and not suffer a problem until I hit a flash page. But then you just cancel that one uh, Chrome process and you're good to go again. Firefox, on the other hand, to me, uh, starts getting a little bloated. Not hating on Firefox. It got, it, it got me started. But in either Firefox or Chrome, you've got the concept of, a, of an inspector. And in inspector, you've also got this console. And what you can do with that is pop it open. That's not it. You pop it open. I'm using the keyboard shortcut on Windows of Command-Shift-C. Or in Mac, it's that's a Mac command. Command-Shift-C on Mac, or Control-Shift-C on Windows. And that gives you this little inspector tool here. You click, click on anything you like to click on on the page, and you're automatically shown where you are in the source. I'm hoping everyone is familiar with this. Uh, but one thing some people might not know is when you click over to the console tab, and there are all these tabs to go through, is this handy little shortcut, the dollar zero. What's that? Man, tough crowd. Is that better? Is that better, everybody? Okay. Dollar uh, zero here. What this does is it refers to the thing that you're inspecting over here. So if I hit enter, this being jQuery, or uh, JavaScript here, it shows me exactly what I was working on. Well, big whoop de doo OK, I'll tell you what the whoop de doo is. You can do things like, let me show you where I found this very useful. I was building a feature the other day. And I had to check all these checkboxes. And I thought, man, that's a lot of checkboxes to check. There are bookmarklets called check them all. That was kind of a neat thing. But when you have so many checkboxes and they're all in different field sets, as they are here, you have to come up with something else. So in this particular case, I came over here, I inspected it, and I got to know where I was in here. So in this case, I think it was like features export list or something. I wonder if it's still in my command recall. Oh, that's great. <laughs> uh, this is probably not going to work. It never works on the. This is a different screen. Uh, you can do all your jQuery techniques, like get into your jQuery, and then you can start saying, I want to set the value to XYZ. I remember what this was for. Ha! <laughs> this is for the, uh, the actual content, the structure page here. I have, I wanted to add an existing field from another content type and put it on this one. And you can see they have quite a few. But I didn't want to scroll all the way. So I did something like, um, is that what I did? This says, I'm going to inspect it first. This says, go to that select box, set the value to this one, and then click it too. So if you don't click it, here's what happens. Let's see if it works. I didn't do it right. Had I done it right, it would have come right to it, set the field to the right value, and then the click event lets Drupal or tells Drupal to go do this thing, uh, that little change event so that you get the stuff. So it's a fun little technique that uh, helps you get around. Dollar zero gets you to where you are. Dollar one gets you up a level, out of there. If you are deeper in there, um, I believe it continues on down the pipe. So dollar zero, dollar one, dollar two is a body tag now. You can work your way out that way. And again, that's useful when you need to do some uh, modifying on the fly. Console.log, I wanted to mention that, is uh, 
quite useful. It's as simple as just doing console.log some message, right? You can slip this into your JavaScript code in a particular uh, whatever it is you're doing. But what's really neat is debugging in the browser. If you've not debugged in the browser, you're in for a real treat. I can't think of something that's got an issue now. Um, you can do things like you can say pause on next thing that happens. So I just now moused over. I guess there's a big mouse event somewhere on the screen. And it's taken me right to the JavaScript code. You can format it nice and pretty. It takes you right to the JavaScript code, and you can see where you are and what's going on in there. I uh, was surpri I wasn't surprised, but I was surprised to see that there was an event there. Well, how could I have known that there's an event there? There's a really nifty tool I just discovered the other day. I cannot take any credit for writing it. It's called Visual Event. Let me see if I've got a link to that. It's not, it's not immediately findable on, on Google, because a visual event gives you a lot of information. Let's see if I can give you something to Google for. How about a link to GitHub? How about not? How about we search for it again? Spry Media. Here's the guy. So what Visual Event gives you is an on-screen visual browser of all the, all the elements that have JavaScript events bound to them, uh, handlers bound to them. <coughs> what is something I was looking at? Let's take a look here. Are we off the screen again, everybody? OK. I had a heck of a time working with a really neat module called references underscore dialog. And what that module does, when you're on a node form and you've got a field that is a node reference field, you can click to add a new node while, without leaving the original node page you're editing. Nothing new. So what I did was I threw up a little test instance. Didn't have the theme on it to confuse me. Didn't have any of the other functionality to confuse me. Uh, but what it just did, what this module did was uh, my autocomplete didn't have the item I needed, so I created a new node. Now it's in the database, and it's auto-selected. I thought, well, that's really neat. I'd like to do something else with it. I'd like to make it work with checkboxes. And that's where I got a little bit confused. <sighs> Cannot demonstrate it, but I'll give you a visual event. Um, so the idea with visual event here, I just clicked the little bookmarklet up here. To install it, you get to go to the bookmarklet, drag it to your toolbar, it's there. To turn it on and off, you click it. And it gives you everything that has an event on the page. Uh, you recognize this Drupal admin menu up here. Well, those all have hover events. And sure enough, it tells you it's got the mouse over, mouse out. If you're not interested in seeing this, you could say, for visual event, remove from display, and kind of hide that thing. That's useful for these big overarching type events that take over the whole form. Take that, uh, take that off. And now we're down to what's more interesting. I need to get to, yeah, see? Can't get to it. I need to get to these guys. So you hide all those events. And now I can see what happens when you click on that particular thing. So if you've ever wondered, hey, I'm working on this hard on this JavaScript thing. I click, click. It goes to my create node form. It's not popping anything up. What's going on? Is my event even bound? Click visual event. It'll tell you right away. Uh, and then you can also trigger the event itself right from there. Hello. Lots of stuff to hide here. It's busy in that DOM, isn't it? All right. So yeah, visual event, great tool, has helped immensely. When going back to the um, Really? Uh, so that's on the client side. When going to the server, of course, there's a real basic techniques of verdump and printr. Verdump throws whatever value you have, spits it down into a string representation of 
its thing. If it's an array, it'll give you all that big deep array. And print R shows you that a little bit nicer formatting. Um, I think it's formatted for HTML. So it's not you don't have to view source to see it structured. But take a step further, there's a module Chromo, maybe? K R KPR? Chromo. Um, there's a there's a module you can install in PHP and it comes with uh, it comes with the Devel module on Drupal, D E V E L, and it exposes the KPR tool. KPR is the same thing as uh, this print R or var dump, but it makes it a very nice little uh, browser, a navigable structure. DPM takes that KPR and stuffs it into a Drupal set message. And what that means is you can stick it in your module code, and then on the next visit, the next browser of the page, or when you do something that does a ca causes a page refresh, instead of throwing this var dump out on the screen, it gives you that nice KPR and it's right there in, in the top with all of your Drupal messages. For instance, I think we just saw not here. I think we saw that in action up here. Let me turn off visual event. So I have in my code a DPM, and it shows you this on a particular variable. I, I didn't name I didn't name the variable in this case, but uh, it gives you all the deep array that you're used to seeing for Drupal development. So extremely helpful, DPM. <coughs> and then uh, if that's just not good enough to make you happy, you can also go and do debugging in your IDE. If you've not done live debugging, it's a, it's a, it's a good experience in Drupal. And then you discover you're not going to just hit debug on the front page. You're going to stick the debug where you want it to go. The way you go about doing that, because there's not a break message, I'm going to write this out because this is easier for me. You have something going on in your module, and you can say debugger equals true. And just set an empty line like this. Put your debug breakpoint on that empty little line, and you can put this uh, in your uh, in tests. So if you've got a loop that's going through an array of 100 elements, you don't want to run, you don't want the breakpoint to fire every time, so you can just say next, 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 next. You can run a test in there within your loop. If this value is xyz, debugger equals true, put the breakpoint on that, and now you're down deep in the loop exactly where you want to be at the time of debugging. I'm hoping we can run through a little debug session here. Um, if we can make time appear out of nowhere. I don't think that's going to happen. We, we'll get into more meaty things on uh, debugging, I hope. Let me just burn through real quick that keeping clients happy is also a very good idea. We talked about the relationship. Well, there are different ways to keep the client happy. Don't send them hate mail. No, you can send them hate mail. If they like you, they'll, they'll laugh. But the regular demonstrable progress is, is key. We talked about this. So you can split up your work between heavy stuff, either that's going to take forever, and little low-hanging fruit that you can deliver right away. Or you can split up your work, and you can split up your work between the deep functionality that no one will ever see. Maybe it's got to do with refactoring some database table or something. It takes a lot of time, but they never see anything out of it. They say, well, I'm paying you all this money. You're not going to show me anything. Well, give them some theming touches to change the color of the page or something. Um, oh, I put a caveat. Sometimes it does mean breaking scope, single scope, because you can't bury your head in functionality forever. Uh, da, da, da. There are the type of people that like to wireframe every little thing and get client sign off from every little thing. And that takes an agile project or something that could be making progress and makes it very waterfallish. And it may be fine because they may not change the specs. And it's great to have your assets there anytime you want. But honestly, as a developer in the field, when I'm given just a gajillion tons of assets and they say, OK, go to town. For me, I'm still going to revisit each one as I'm working on it because I can't keep it all in my head. 
it's there, but I can't keep it all in my head. And I'm going to say, well, what does this button do? What does this button? And even and if it's super detailed documentation, it just takes my mind and kind of turns it off a little bit. And it's best to touch base with the client regularly uh, in that regard. Uh, I do want to mention that it's important. I've gone, again, 180 on, not quite 180. I've gone full circle. I've gone 360 on this, where you start out with basically no project management. You dive into a project. You pick it up, start working on it, and that's how you work. And then you start learning about some DevOps, start learning about some workflow. You're like, oh, this is great. All my projects are going to be, you know, quadruple the budget now because we're going to implement all these things. Oh, we didn't talk about continuous integration. Continuous integration is a neat thing, too. As you're making changes, you commit it to your code, uh, commit it to your your source code repository, and you've got something running out there that's sniffing for code changes, and it'll pick it up and deploy it automatically, either to say staging or if you've got, uh, if you trust your code, you can also have it go out to production automatically. There are a number of tools to do that. But my point in saying this is that if you haven't got that, you don't necessarily need that for your project. Or if you have it for a project, if it takes some time to set up, you don't necessarily need it for all your projects. And it's kind of a, now it's a no-brainer for me to think that. But before I would have thought, well, this is not really satisfying the purist in me. I've got my workflow. I know how I work, and everything has to work this way. Well, it's not true. At the end of the day, uh, there are people, stakeholders. They're human. They want results. That's what they want. So we just get the work done how we need to get it done. If the workflow greatly helps, if it helps to sort out issues, if it helps to make things efficient, like uh, maybe there's maybe there's something that requires a fresh install every time for whatever reason, then, or maybe you're working through a bug that has this particular server scenario. Well, if you can freeze that setup, and this becomes part of your workflow, if you can freeze that setup and say, all right, I'm going to spin up this local instance at that snapshot, if it helps to have that kind of mechanism for your particular thing, then by all means spend some time building out that workflow. If not, then you're perhaps potentially over, over devoping, overthinking that particular solution. Same thing with project management. <coughs> if, if you don't need a daily stand-up or a weekly stand-up, or if you don't need uh, you know, big, long emails with every deployment saying, hey, all this happened, then maybe you don't need to do it. You know? The client may or may not appreciate it. But if it's just taking up time and you could be getting work done, maybe it's too much. Or if you've got a client who keeps changing his or her mind all the time, then it's a great idea to have excellent documentation not for uh, like, hey, 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 but just if something comes up, you've got, this is what we agreed on. This is what we're doing. If you need to change your mind, sir or madam, we can change it on the next sprint. You know, that's how this particular thing works. OK, you know what that screen means? It means we're at 1030. Uh, yeah, go ahead. I just want to say that please feel free to reach out and contact me. I, uh, I'm here. I, I never have time for anything, but if you get me at the right time, I'll have all the time in the world for you. Because one of the things that uh, that has, well, the thing that's helped me, you've heard the whole standing on the shoulders of giants things. Drupal is just a fantastic open source project. It's robust. It's it's scalable. It's you know, don't let your J2E friends tell you otherwise. You can uh, you can make it perform. All these great things. It's good for rapid development. It's good for big enterprise development. However, uh, do not forget the community. There's a zillions of, there's either multiple zillions or one zillion of volunteers out there, and we're all doing work volunteer. If you can work it into your client billing, that's even better because you're contributing back to the core product. You're improving the client's project, including uh, improving the, the world's projects. But uh, that's how we all work together. If you feel you're not able to give back, you can always give back. You can give your feedback. You can talk to people who know the channels and the right people to talk to and give feedback. You can go to the issue queue. You can write very nicely worded issues and that help, help the module maintainers to reproduce a given issue. If you're, uh, if you're just kind of leeching off the system, well, you're still part of the ecosystem, and I still love you too. Anyway, this is my contact information. From here, you should be able to find me any number of different ways, and I, I welcome any contact? Yes. Sorry. Go ahead. You had a question. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, it's uh, a debugging question. Um, I have run into stuff with uh, contrib modules where I go and set something in the admin of some contrib module, but and then I, but I need to get it in code. I can't really live with being having to go and click it in the admin. And sometimes I can't I can't really figure.
figure out where to set a breakpoint in somebody else's code to, ah. to capture what it is that you really don't want. Yeah, that's tough, huh? <laughs> um, there's a thing called the st stack. Oh, yes. I even promised you I'd repeat it. So sorry. Um, we were asked here how, especially with a contrib module, how do you go about finding where a given bug is to set your breakpoints? Well, if I could step through a debug session right now, maybe I can briefly. Let's see here. Oh, this will be totally random. Not going to do it. Um, when you're in a debug session, it shows you the stack trace, and it shows you where you've been, or where, where the PHP compiler has been. And that provides some hints. If it's in the middle of a block, if it's a PHP, a PHP island in the middle of a block or a node, you're going to have a tough time. But if it's not, if it's actual code in third-party contrib module code, then in the breakpoint, in the uh, stack, you'll see the file name, you'll see the line number and all that, and you kind of work your way backwards. If you have a particular issue, we can look at it offline, but uh, it, it can be challenging. I worked on a project where we had just a ton of stuff, just PHP in and out of all the nodes themselves and in blocks, and it's not easy to, to sniff them out. There you go. Sorry. I had a sorry, I saw a hand this way. It was not launching a tomato. Okay. Does anybody have any questions? Anybody have any comments? Very good. Thank you again very much for your time here. I uh, I look forward to seeing you out on the floor the rest of the thing and I, I think there's a party going on this evening too. I, I intend to catch up on some sleep. Thank you everybody. <laughs>